Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our October installment of our Capital Kids series, which is tailor-made to bring uh, authors, speakers, notable figures to classroom and young adult audiences, classroom and children's audiences uh, nationwide. My name is Samuel Holliday, and I have the tremendous privilege of serving as Director of Operations and Scholarship for the United States Capitol Historical Society. And we're so grateful that so many of you are taking time out of your busy day, especially your busy classroom days, to join us for this ongoing exploration of topics in American history and American life. Before we get started with today's wonderful program, I'd like to do a little bit of technical housekeeping. You know, while we connect virtually, there are some great ways to interact in these programs using the Zoom webinar platform. Uh, if you have any questions for Dr. Bruchak throughout the course of today's program, you can go ahead and submit those into the Q&A section of the webinar. That looks like two speech bubbles, either at the top or bottom of your screen, depending on what kind of device you're using to join us today. And I'll ask that if you're sending in classroom questions, please note that in the question so we can make sure we answer as many of those as possible. Now, if you have any technical difficulties, if you need some technical troubleshooting assistance, please put those matters into the chat section of the webinar, which looks like a single speech bubble at the top or bottom of your screen, and I'll try and deal with those in real time. But again, any questions for our fantastic speaker today can go to the Q&A section, and I'll pose them to him at the uh, tail end of the program. It's now also my great pleasure to introduce today's featured guest. For over 40 years, Dr. Joseph Bruchak has been creating literature and music that reflect his indigenous heritage and traditions. He is a proud Nolhegan Abenaki, a citizen and a respected elder among his people. He's the author of more than 120 books for children and adults. As a professional teller of traditional tales of the Adirondacks and the native peoples of the Northeastern woodlands, Joe Bruchak has performed widely in Europe and throughout the United States. He has been a storyteller in residence for Native American organizations and schools throughout the continent. He discusses native culture and his book in, in his books and does storytelling programs at dozens of elementary and secondary schools each year as a visiting author. Dr. Bruchak lives in the Adirondack Mountain foothills of Greenfield Center, New York, the same house where his maternal grandparents raised him. Much of his writing draws on that land and his Native American ancestry. Although his Northeastern American Indian heritage is only one part of an ethnic background that includes Slovak and English blood, those Native roots are the ones by which he has been most nourished. Uh, Dr. Bruchak's honors include a Rockefeller Humanities Fellowship, a National Endowment for the Arts Writing Fellowship for Poetry, the Cherokee Nation Prose Award, the Knickerbocker Award, the Hope S. Dean Award for Notable Achievement in Children's Literature, and both the 1998 Writer of the Year Award and 1998 Storyteller of the Year Award from the WordCraft Circle of Native Writers and Storytellers. In 1999, he received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Native Writers Circle of the Americas. We are honored to have Dr. Joseph Bruchak here to talk about his wonderful latest book, Res Dogs, which is an absolute delight. And it, it really captures so much of the experience we've all lived through in these last couple of years uh, through pandemic and American life. So Dr. Bruchak, uh, please tell us, what it, was it like to write this book? Tell us what inspired you to write this book and tell us some of the story of Res Dogs, if you will. Kwai kwai ni dovak, hello my friends. I'd like to introduce myself in the Abenaki language, Dunluizi Sozap, Alanoki da Hozid. My name is Joe, or the peaceful one. And I in Salatog, Yalanobizon Vig, Taladalon, that got above the area we call a Saratoga, or the Medicine Spring Place in the Adirondack Mountain region. And Ta'alobania, I am a human being, Ta Kiak, as are all of you. We're all part of one circle. And we certainly were part of one circle for the last few years dealing with the unexpected uh, issues of having to avoid being with others in ways we've done for years, and suddenly we found ourselves thrown on our own resources. Res Dogs is an interesting book for me. Uh, first of all, I should tell you, I didn't write it. I dictated it into my cell phone. Every morning, I would walk my dog, and as I walked my dog, I would talk into the phone, the things I was thinking about, and it gradually became chapters of a story that seemed to be coming to me as I was doing that walking with my dog. Dogs have always been very important to me, as I think you may guess if you read Res Dogs, they are to indigenous people all around this continent, uh, Central South America. 
And the idea of the dog as a companion is a very old idea. So as I developed this story, or maybe as the story developed itself, dogs were where it began and dogs were where it continued. Stories that related to them, stories that came from them, and of course, the relationship between us and those four-legged creatures. Within the book, you'll see my main character, Molly Ann, is a young woman who's living on one of our reservations in the area we now call New England, which in our Abenaki language is called Ndakina. Ndakina simply means our land, not in the sense so much of ownership as that we are part of it and that we share it, which is a very important difference. The idea of story is central to the book. That story is always used for at least two reasons traditionally, and I do this too with my writing as well as my storytelling. First, a story has to entertain. If it's entertaining, people will listen and also more likely they'll hold on to it and remember it. But also a story should contain within it useful lessons. Things that tell us about the world around us that help us understand who we are, where we are, where we're going, and also where we've been. And so that idea of the two roles of story are very much within Res Dogs. And you'll notice that Malian's grandparents are the primary storytellers. Although she mentioned stories she heard from her father, appropriately, it is from our elders that stories often come. In fact, the traditional view of it is that it's like a circle. Within that circle, there are certain things we as human beings need to do. The first is to listen with our two ears. If you listen, you'll hear many things, especially stories. The second is to observe. Look at the world around you and really see it in depth and understand it. The third thing is to remember. When we remember those things we've seen, and we've heard those lessons that have been given to us can be applied. And sometimes we never know if one of those lessons will be applied. Then that fourth thing is to share. The idea of completing the circle. So you think of the child as the listener and the elder as the sharer. By the way, also, every human being has two ears and only one mouth because we're supposed to listen twice as much as we talk. That also is part of the storytelling tradition. To listen and listen closely is very important. Now, my main character, Molly Ann, finds herself in a very unfamiliar situation. She's been visiting her grandparents, but then the pandemic suddenly comes out of nowhere, as it seemed to do for all of us. Even though there were warnings, I think no one expected it to be what it was, which was a total shutdown of almost everything in our lives. And Molly Ann finds herself there on the reservation where she's visiting, and she can't leave. She is there with her grandparents separated from her mother and father, separated from her school. And the only link she has is through her cell phone or the kind of link that many of us had was uh, with our portable computers or our online presence, as opposed to really being with someone in person. And as is the case with many of our reservation communities, her cell service was not that great. So often she couldn't even do that. But what happened is that two things step in to help her understand, and in fact, to continue to learn. The first, right away on the first page, is the appearance of this dog that she calls Malsum, the old word for wolf. The dog shows up, and it's interesting because, I thought, let me read a little bit from that first chapter and you'll see what I mean. Chapter one, Malsum. When Molly Ann woke up and looked out her window, the dog was there just as she had dreamed it would be. Now that one little paragraph, as she had dreamed it would be. Dreams are very important in traditional culture. We often say a dream is a message from the creator, a way to help us understand things. So that dog showing up and she had dreamed about it being there is almost like an answer to whatever prayer she might be making for guidance. It was lying on the driveway halfway between their small house and the road. It wasn't sleeping. Its head was up, its ears erect, its paws in front of it, as if on guard. So right away, you see the character of Malsum the dog has a very special meaning. It is there, as dogs often are, to help, to watch over and to guard. 
And that picture of that dog sitting there is like so many dogs I've seen and known in my life who literally feel it is their responsibility to take care of us as much as we take care of them. As Malian watched, the dog turned its head to look right at her, as if it knew her, as if it had known her for a long, long time. Walsam, she said, Kwai Kwai Ni Don Ma. Hello, hello, my friend. And right away you're being introduced to the indigenous language which is spoken in various dialects or forms throughout New England by five different tribal nations, Western Abenaki, Penobscot, Passamaquoddy, Maliseet, and Mi'kmaq or Mi'kmaq. We all speak the same or a similar language. And that idea of saying hello to someone as a friend, ni don ba, sort of means my person, my friend. It's applied not just to human beings, but to other things within the natural world. In this case, the dog that she names Balsam. The big dog nodded and then turned back to continue watching the road. Balsam, that was the old name for a wolf. It was a good one for that dog. It was as big as a wolf. It looked like the videos of wolves she'd watched on her phone. The only things different were the white spots about it, were the white spots over each of its eyes. By the way, all of a sudden you realize this is not a story taking place in the distant past. My main character, a native girl, has a cell phone and has been watching videos on it. So she is very much a nowadays kid. And as is the case with all of us these days, we're always watching videos and things on our phones that normally we wouldn't have access to. So it's a different world, but it's also at the same time, a very traditional world that she's in because as soon as she thinks that, she hears a voice, four-eyed dog, a soft voice said from back over her shoulder. It was Grandma Frances. Malian had not heard her come up behind. She was used to that. Both her grandparents could walk so softly that she never knew they were there until they spoke. Grandma Frances would tease her about it. Be careful, granddaughter. You don't want to let no Indian sneak up on you. And here, introducing the grandparents, two interesting things are happening. One, the grandmother comes up quietly behind her. And by the way, we are taught from childhood to walk quietly and to listen, to not make a lot of noise. When you're going through the forest, don't make a lot of noise. When you're walking into a room, don't do a lot to call attention to yourself. Walk in quietly. In fact, I'm always surprising people when I come up behind them without intending to go, hello, and they're, what was that? Because I walk very softly. In fact, one of my traditional names is Quiet Bear, or the bear who walks quietly. And Grandma Frances immediately makes a joke. She refers to the old stereotype of Native people, or Indians, sneaking up on people. And she does so in a joking way. And that introduction of humor is very important. Let me assure you that whenever you're involved, around Native people in a Native community, eventually there's going to be teasing, joking, and laughter. Laughter, I have been told by my elders over the years, is a very powerful medicine. When you laugh, it can help you feel better. It can help you understand things better. And I don't mean laughing at someone. No, I mean laughing with people, or sometimes even laughing at yourself for the foolish things you've done. That idea of laughter is immediately introduced, and I've only gone about one and a half pages into this story. And already I'm talking about a number of things. One, that have to do with the current situation in the story of the pandemic, but two, the lasting nature of Native American cultures. Uh, you have to understand that often the picture painted of American Indians, and by the way, that term American Indian is perfectly acceptable. The National Museum of the American Indian was named that by indigenous people from all around both continents who felt it was the most inclusive term in English to describe our indigenous nations of many different languages, of many different cultures. And in fact, that idea of Indian or Native American, both of those are terms in the English language. I refer to my own people as Nalhegan of Beneke. And I think you should begin, if you look at a group of people, with what they call themselves. What is your identity? Not what we put on you as an identity, but what do you call yourself? And then that general term of American Indian or Native American, just like the general term of European 
or African or Asian could be applied. But what nation, what language, what culture specifically are you from? And uh, Grandma Frances put her hand on Molly Ann's shoulder. Looks to me like he thinks he belongs here, she said. Then she chuckled, or maybe like he thinks he owns this place. Would that be okay, Molly Ann said. Grandma Frances chuckled again. It seems to me it's not up to us. When a dog like that just appears and chooses you, it's not your decision. By the way, notice that Grandma Frances called Malsum a four-eyed dog because there are two dots on its forehead or its eyes. And you learn later in the story that traditionally among many of our people in the Northeast, when a dog was born that way, we said that dog has power, has a certain sacred or mystical nature about it, and can see with those two dots as well as with its two eyes. So it becomes what we call a four-eyed dog. Within the story, you'll find that stories appear again and again. Every story leads to another story. And the idea of story, which I mentioned earlier, as a teaching device is very important. If someone says to you, I want to tell you something that you need to know for your own good, I have to say, most people start going, la, 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 you know, you're not listening anymore. When someone tries to tell you what to do, it's human nature to resist it. But when you hear a story, people start listening. In fact, if you're ever in a group of people and someone says, let me tell you a story, you notice how people turn in that direction to listen, because story is a powerful thing. As I mentioned earlier, it's interesting, but it's also useful. Within our indigenous traditions throughout North America, by the way, I'm generalizing. Remember, there are 500 and more recognized tribal nations just within the United States, more than 500. And there are more beyond that. Some have state recognition, some are not yet recognized, yet they know who they are. And recognition is a complicated thing. It's sort of like being a thoroughbred dog. Only Native Americans and their American Indians have to be recognized by some entity which is not Native to be regarded as legally uh, American Indian. That's another story I won't get into today. But the idea of a community knowing who they are and sharing their values and almost all, probably all, of those 500 different native nations and more believe that we need to be respectful children. The idea that children are to be seen and not heard is not an American Indian idea. If you go to any community, the kids are everywhere taking part in everything and they're learning by doing. The old way of learning is not by reading a book or memorizing a lesson, but by being with people who know how to do something and helping them and imitating them, eventually being good at it yourself. And if someone did something wrong to this day, often the first thing that would happen is that someone would say, well, let me tell you a story, not shout at them, not say they're stupid, not punish them. My grandfather told me when he was a child, his father and his mother never struck him. They never even shouted at him. But if he did something wrong, they would talk to him. They would tell him a story. And sometimes he said, I'd almost rather have been hit because those stories were powerful things. A story can amuse, it can frighten. We actually do scary stories in our tradition. In fact, uh, my two sons and I run something called the Indakina Education Center. It's an outdoor education center here in Greenfield Center, New York on family land. It's a hundred acres of a nature preserve, all in a conservation easement. And we do programs there of many kinds. And uh, coming up on the 29th of this month, we do our annual scary story night. So we tell traditional native stories that are often very, very scary. But the idea of a story scaring someone, reminding them of what is wise or unwise to do is very much part of traditional culture. In fact, it is often said that if you strike a child, you may damage their spirit. You may hurt their body. You may teach them the lesson that someone large has the right to abuse someone who is smaller. And the lesson being intended may not be taught at all because of that bad feeling you get from being mistreated. In fact, 
I would say in general, if someone is a bully, it's a person, a boy or a girl, a woman or a man, a person who has been badly treated by someone more powerful than they are, and therefore they then take it out on someone less powerful than them. All through res dogs, you'll find that whenever Malian observes something, has a problem, comes to something, invariably her grandmother or her grandfather will show up and start explaining something to her. And this book is very wide ranging, although it's a short book and I wrote it in poetic form. I like the idea of, of short lines. I think it's easier to carry the story that way more quickly. And also it is the rhythm of speech. And also I realized after I'd been writing it for a while, it's the rhythm of my walking as I was walking and dictating. The story was telling itself along the lines of that rhythm of my walking. So here is another example where one of the grandparents shows up. Molly Ann is uh, stuck inside. She has no cell reception. She can't do the lesson she's supposed to do. She's watching it rain. Molly Ann watched the cold rain drops splashing down on the black plastic her grandparents used to cover the mulch on top of the garden. By the way, Native American community, Native American family, but they're using black plastic to cover the mulch, which is a traditional way of restoring fertility to the earth by giving back to the earth those things that otherwise might be thrown away as garbage. The heat breaking it down into good dark earth, cooking it real good all through the winter was what Grandpa Roy had said. Potatoes, Grandpa Roy said sort of half to himself, always the first to be planted up here. You know, potatoes came from Andean folks up in the mountains of South America, where it gets a lot colder than this. They had hundreds and hundreds of kinds. Problem in Ireland, when they had that potato famine I mentioned the other day, reason that all their potatoes died from that blight was that they all just grew one variety. Ireland, Molly Ann thought. I used to dream about going places like Ireland and Spain, but maybe now the way the world was, there were places she would never go. Again, within that brief little section, several things are happening. One, Molly Ann is feeling what I think a lot of us were feeling during the pandemic. Will I ever travel again? Will I ever be able to see my friends in person again? It's easy to fall into despair, but whenever that happens to Molly Ann in this story, there's always something that pulls her out of it, often a story or the presence of that dog, Malsum, who seems to be there every time that Molly Ann needs company, needs companionship. And you notice what the grandfather told her about potatoes, referring to something called the potato famine, which occurred in Ireland uh, back well over, way, way over a hundred years ago. The potatoes in Ireland literally all died of a blight because only one variety of potato had been imported from South America. What they called the Irish potato was really a South American potato. And that idea that they grew more than one kind, that biodiversity, something you may not have heard of, I hope you have, biodiversity is very important, that there are many varieties of some plant many different kinds of animals, many different things, make sure that the biome, the living cycle of life on this earth remains healthy. And the, the grandfather is actually referring to that idea of health through diversity, just in that one remark. And it harkens back to a very interesting thing, which I mentioned earlier in the book, that during the Irish potato famine, Native American people, American Indians, raised money and sent it to help the people in Ireland through the potato famine. The Choctaw Nation in particular did that. And to this day in Ireland, there is actually a statue honoring the American Indian people who did their best to help the suffering Irish people during that potato famine. And why did they do it? Because they themselves had experienced suffering and difficulty. And if you yourself have experienced difficulty, Instead of feeling sorry for yourself, instead of uh, engaging in self-pity, look where you yourself may help others suffering something like what you went through. And so there's a lot of different dimensions to almost every page in Res Dog is packed with lots of little things, little lessons, 
little teachings, but also I hope it's fun and interesting to read because to me, the best books are the books that are interesting. And uh, I want to pause here for just a second because I'm feeling thirsty. And one thing I was taught is one of the great things we can do in life is to be thankful. When we're speaking thanks in the Abeniki language, you say, Oli which means good, I return it to you. And I was taught by such elders as De La Santa, who was the head clan mother of the Eel clan on the Onondaga Reservation, a very dear friend, is that when you drink water, this is a gift from the Creator. You should say, thank you. What do you need to be? Is how we say it in Abeniki. What do you need to be? Or Nyaweha in, in Haudenosaunee, in the Onondaga tongue. So what do you need to be? That water is really good, especially at that moment. There are little things we need to be thankful for. And that's another teaching or I think experience within the pandemic that we've all been taught. There are so many little things we took for granted that no longer became possible. And Malian herself, I think, exemplifies that in many cases. I also wanted to share with you a couple of aspects of our, our native culture uh, before going a little further and talking about the book a bit more and then going to give you an opportunity to ask some questions. And one is that if I were meeting you in person, I would have begun with the drum because the drum has within it the sound of the heartbeat that brings us all together. And uh, when we travel to this day, we say we are doing something that we did long ago. We'd arrive in a new community. We wanted people to know we were arriving. Usually we'd be traveling. Uh, in your case, I'd be coming down the Potomac, that river that flows through Washington, D.C. And because it's not my homeland, I would uh, then, before I landed, I would sing what's called a welcoming or a greeting song. I'd be greeting the people on shore, asking to be welcomed. And that's a very polite way to ask permission to land. I didn't do that at the start. I probably should have. So let me do that right now. So belatedly asking permission to land by singing a song in a Beneke, which is a song which simply says, we greet you and we are asking to be invited to visit you. He go, he go ni. Song. By the way, notice on the front of this drum, there are four diamonds. That stands for the four directions and also to listen, to observe, to remember, and to share. And the bear in the center has an arrow within it, which is significant of the breath of life that is within us all and shared within a circle. Uh, there are so many things that are part of our traditional culture that we take for granted, perhaps, of any traditional culture. I know. A lot of people take things for granted about what American culture is, but there's often a much deeper meaning. And that meaning, for example, when I said thank you to the water, we have the tradition of Thanksgiving. And in America, perhaps it's not understood. Not only does it come originally from native people, but Thanksgiving is not just one day for indigenous people. It is every day of the year. There's always something we need to be thankful for. If only the gift of being able to walk around and breathe the air. And if you've ever had a problem with breathing or with walking around like the pandemic, oh boy, did people not take breathing for granted as we all wore masks, as many people had difficulty even breathing in the air of life. So let me share with you another of our traditional instruments. This is a Native American flute made from the branch of the tree. They say, a woodpecker made holes in a hollow branch and the wind blowing through it gave someone the idea of turning that into a flute, into a musical instrument. And I'm going to do this play for you. One of the songs I learned about 50 years ago from an elder named Swift Eagle, who was a very important teacher of mine. And this is a song 
uh, to greet the day, a morning song from the uh, Pueblo people of the Southwest. My plan was to do about a half an hour presentation, which I've done, and then to see what questions you have, because the questions always lead to answers that may in themselves uh, be a story. So I thought we'd do that right now, if that sounds good. Absolutely. Well, Dr. Bruchak, this has been delightful. I feel like we could listen to you for hours and hours, but uh, we do. We are starting to get some questions. And again, please, uh, for our, our wonderful folks listening in, uh, if you have questions, put them into that Q&A section uh, as, so I can start posing them to Dr. Bruchak. We'll start with one uh, that's a really interesting question from, from an old friend uh, who writes in that uh, from what he's heard today, it would seem that uh, the convention of the sort of Western convention of uh, young adult fiction and adult fiction might not be so so bright a line uh, in in more traditional uh, American Indian uh, culture. Is that something? Uh, uh, is is that so, does that sound like a fair uh, read of that? Is that uh, is that something you've found uh, in in your lived experience and in your studies? Well, to begin with, that's a really great question. I appreciate it very much because it gives me an opportunity to expound on something I believe, which is one, stories are for everyone. They're not just for children. And two, the lessons within stories can be taught in very simple language and be very complex. So when I write supposedly for kids, often I find that adults are reading the books as well as young people and getting just as much out of them. I have a book called Code Talker, which is about the, uh, the Navajo, the Diné people and men in World War II who use their language to create an unbreakable code. And that book is very popular. But I have discovered, even though it was uh, marketed as a, a sort of middle grader, then a YA book, it has a wide, wide readership uh, because the men are Marines. Marines all over the world have, read that book. Uh, there are copies of the book in Antarctica, <laughs> in, in Asia. <laughs> I mean, it's like everywhere I turn, someone has read the book and said they really appreciated the story. And often they're not kids, they're adults. So I think a good story cuts across those supposed dividing lines. Western culture likes to divide things up. And that question of dividing things up and, and making, oh, you are this, you are that, this is this, this is that. And uh, that again is not true in many indigenous cultures. We recognize the continuous flow through so many things. And story is one of those things that flows from childhood to age. Absolutely. Well put. Well put. Uh, well put, Joe. I, so related to these, the importance of these stories. Um, you know, I, I uh, they're throughout Res Dogs. You, you write these beautiful stories, uh, and they're passed along as as you mentioned from uh, Mylan's uh, grandparents to her. Are these stories that you grew up with? Were you told these stories by your grandparents, or are these stories you've picked up over the years? Uh, they're told so lovingly. It feels like something like an old friend. Well, I have to say, first of all, I'm 80 years old. So I, my childhood was a long time ago. And when I was a kid, there were no really good books about native culture. Often things were highly stereotyped and native people were portrayed as vanishing. It was also a time when I was a child when many people who were native did not want to call attention to themselves. So my grandfather would never refer to himself as Indian or Native American or a Beneke, even though he was very visibly so. And many things he taught me were that way. So he did not tell me the traditional stories. He told me stories about working as a logger and a lumberjack and his own experiences. I had those stories, which were very, very good stories and often teaching tales. But when I was a kid, it was safe to be an Indian here in this Northeast area if you were a professional Indian. If you were working in a tourist attraction, and every year we would travel around to places like, say, the Enchanted Forest in northern New York, where a man named uh, Maurice Dennis Madawilasas, an Abenaki elder, uh, taught many things. And I heard him tell stories when I was a little kid. 
we went to a place called the Indian Village in Lake George where a man named Dahana Dolans, Ray Fadden, and his family worked, and he would tell those stories. And later on, Ray would found the Six Nations Haudenosaunee or Iroquois Museum, a great influence on all uh, Iroquois people, quite frankly. And uh, my friend Madawa Lassus, uh, little loon, he would become a, a mentor of mine. When I was an adult, I went around seeking out all these people I'd met as a child and seen in performance situations and really became close to them. So from my late teenage years on, I was seeking out those connections and learning those stories. So if I say I've known a story for 50 years, it might be I learned it when I was 30 years old, <laughs> but they have a, a real wonderful relationship with the stories too. I always try to credit those who have given me the stories, who have entrusted me with the stories. And uh, Res Dogs uh, is an example of that. So many of the stories there came from, for example, Maurice Dennis, Madawi Lassus, or Stephen Laurent, Atian Lolo, or any one of a number of other people uh, throughout New England. And I deliberately did not identify the reservation. I left it open so that it could be one place or another. It could be Pleasant Point. It could be another reservation, even run New Brunswick, where many, many of our people are located. So, so there is that as a long answer to a short question. Oh, it's, it's an excellent, it's an excellent answer. And uh, for I'll, I'll, uh, and first off, I would never have believed uh, 80. So congratulations to you, sir. Uh, uh, I've got a, a comment from one of our wonderful listeners uh, uh, who uh, uh, says that you uh, remind them of Mr. Rogers, uh, and they mean that in the most glowing way. And and I, I echo the sentiment. So uh, you've 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 charmed us thoroughly. Uh, as and and questions are still coming in, but I wanted to pass that along. Well, I have uh, to make a comment there because I love Fred Rogers. One of the things I've done over the years is writing and poetry workshops and storytelling workshops in prisons. And uh, the uh, Western Penitentiary in, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, had a room for uh, the visitation of families. And Fred Rogers funded that room and made it possible for parents and to get together in the prison. And I visited Fred on set a couple of times. And one of the funniest things I could ever imagine happening, he was so much himself, no matter where he was, we were talking and the, the phone rang and he picked up the phone. It was his wife. And Fred Rogers goes, oh, hello, mommy. Um, I'm here with the most wonderful man right now. And we're talking about stories. It's so interesting. Now you want me to, okay, mommy, let me write that down. A quart of milk, a dozen, <laughs> not a grocery list to pick up on his way home. And I'm thinking, <laughs> Oh, Fred Rogers, I want to hug you right now. <laughs> oh gosh, it, it just warms the heart. Absolutely. Oh my goodness, uh, and and how wonderful that you got to you got to meet and, and know uh, got to meet and know him. Um, I've got a couple of questions coming in about uh, the music, and thank you for for treating us to that as well. Uh, one of our listeners uh, asks uh, a bit of a personal preference question: Do you prefer the drum or the flute? Uh, I know it's it's a difficult question to ask, but uh, but you know we uh, uh, we have folks who may be aspiring musicians on the call sure here. Well, I don't mean be, be facetious, but do you prefer to breathe or do you prefer to have your heart beating? <laughs> Each right. one has its own power and its own place. And I've done music for many years of many kinds. And my two sons and my sister and I used to perform together as the Dawnland Singers, uh, using drum and flute and guitar. I also play guitar. And I think as a musician, you have to listen to your heart. Of course, there's the beat, there's the rhythm, <laughs> but also follow the path that is important to you and never expect it to be easy. Um, as I once said to a friend who, uh, I had a situation where someone came up to me and asked me if uh, I could teach them traditional medicinal ways. And I said, no, I really can't do that. But I have a friend who's a medicine person who, who needs help. If you could spend time with this person, maybe live with them, maybe help them with their groceries, and they'll teach you things you to go along. The person's response was, no, I wanted a weekend seminar. And my response to that was, life is not a weekend seminar. So if it's music or any other undertaking, expect it to be time consuming, to take time, and expect it to be something that will be a process that is gradual and you'll gradually get better as you go along if you stay with it. Well put, Doctor, well put. Um, if I can pose another musical related question, you know, the, uh, the especially, you know, writing this wonderful book in verse, um, it does, you know, lead to a question. Can you talk a little bit about the interplay of storytelling and music or, or telling stories through music? Uh, uh, since, you know, you, uh, 
uh, you know, it seems that they would they would work well together. Could you speak to that a little bit? Yes, they flow together. In fact, that's true in many parts of the world. I was honored to be a volunteer teacher in West Africa for three years. And I was in Ghana as a teacher and uh, I would hear traditional storytelling and often a person would be telling a story, maybe an elderly woman is telling a story, then she would start singing a song and everybody would start singing along with her, even though they hadn't heard the song before, but the song would carry the story along. So song and story really flow together in appropriate ways. And I, I cannot separate the two at times. I think that uh, you really need to know the power of song to be able to uh, access the power of story and the voice itself is a musical instrument. I say we have uh, three major musical instruments, the drum, the rattle, and the flute as a fourth one, as a voice. Excellent, excellent. Well, well put again, my goodness. Um, there are a couple of really wonderful passages that as we've been enjoying your book, uh, my colleagues and I uh, were particularly drawn to. Uh, and if you don't mind, I'll go ahead and uh, I, can, I can read them out and just, you know, if you can expound on, on the, you know, the feeling and, and the inspiration. There's one passage on, uh, there's one passage on page 175 uh, uh, that, uh, uh, no one should feel guilty about the past unless they're not doing anything about the present. Uh, and it goes on, think about what we are doing now and how it will affect the world seven generations from today and not just in the next election. Uh, you know, we, we work here on Capitol Hill. Uh, there's, it's awfully tempting for some folks to, to just focus on that next election. Can you talk about that, that beautiful sentiment of, of you know, uh, take, taking a longer view and, and working for the betterment of your community? Yeah, I think it's something that we as human beings have to be aware of. There was a, uh, a Turkish poet named Nazim Hikmet, whose work I loved, and he wrote a poem about planting trees. Even though you may never live to uh, gain the uh, taste of the fruit, you're doing it for further generations. And that idea of we plant something now and it may be generations in the future when it comes to fruition. So the indigenous view is not to just think of your life as the begin all and the end all and not to think of just, you know, next year or next presidential election, but to look to the long term. What are the results of what we do today? I know in the case of my family, my mother put all of our property into a conservation easement. The first one in Saratoga County, because she wanted it to be there for her grandchildren and the children beyond her grandchildren. That was what she believed. And that kind of approach to life, I think is very, very satisfying. Another, another dear friend of mine was a poet named Wendell Berry. And in his poems and in his writings, he always talks about that idea of considering what we are doing now and how it will affect others in the future. I'm sorry I keep dropping names, but I've learned so much from so many people, and I don't want people to think I'm some kind of you know, repository of all the world's wisdom. I'm often just uh, paraphrasing something that someone else has given to me and always trying to remember to credit them, which is really important to credit those people who have taught you something and to, to not just pretend that we always stand alone. We don't stand alone. Absolutely. We stand on the shoulders of many and, uh, you know, uh, talk about Thanksgiving and, and being grateful for all of the incredible people we get to learn from, yourself especially included, uh, Joe. I think um, one other passage that really struck us as, we, as we've been so enjoying Res Dogs is, uh, you know, perhaps a nice way to sort of uh, bring to a conclusion our, our conversation, uh, unless there are any last questions that folks are sending in this passage on the next page or on page 178 a couple pages later uh, as uh, Mylan is is addressed not to give away the, uh, the 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 ending of the book here as she's Mylan is recording uh, or is reporting take care of each other and take care of our land we need to be kind to each other and to all living things make the circle strong for those who come after us instead of just standing up alone like those first stone people we need to bend our knees and touch the earth and that feels really poignant as we, you know, come out the tail end, uh, you know, hopefully the tail end here of of these challenging times uh, and, you know, how we can stay rooted, as it were. But could you expound a little bit on that notion as well? Well, kindness is very powerful, very important. Uh, I'll tell you a little anecdote, which I always find interesting. Uh, 
I was doing a book tour and I was booked in to be interviewed at a radio station. When I arrived at the radio station, the person who was handling me said, oh, we can't go in because this is now a right wing station. They just changed ownerships and this person wants to tear you apart and tear Indians apart. I said, that's OK. I'll still talk with him. And we had a conversation and every time he became controversial, I was just kind and truthful and left it. I didn't argue. And at the end of the show, he had taken off his hat and he was leaning forward. He said, did anyone ever tell you exude goodness? <laughs> and I said, well, thank you very much. But it wasn't that I was exuding anything. It's just being kind, being thoughtful and appreciating others, even though their point of view may seem radically different than your own. We're all human beings. We're breathing the same air, walking on the same earth, and we need to do it together. And, you know, someone's ideas may not change. And you may not be able to change them. But on the other hand, condemning them and viewing them as the enemy is only going to make it more likely that they will be an enemy. So I, I strongly believe I believe in self-defense, too. I, I do have a black belts in several different martial arts and still teach Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. But okay. I also believe that we as human beings need to be kind to each other. It's a medicine. My goodness. Like I said, Dr. Bruchak, this has been, it's tonic for the soul. I feel like I could listen to you for hours. I'm sure everyone else could, but I know uh, our wonderful classroom audiences have a whole rest of a day filled with learning to get back to. Uh, and and we're so grateful that you've taken the time to share this. I will once again recommend to any and all uh, Res Dogs, you're wonderful. Is this your most recent book? Forgive me uh, if, if you've got one more recent, but this is the one that's been so moving to us. Uh, uh, Pretty recent. I have two or three others that are just coming out, but that's okay. I have one that's going to be out very soon uh, from Raycraft Books called uh, Voices of the People. And it's a series of poems, each one telling the story of a different native person from the peacemaker a thousand years ago down to Wilma Mankiller in uh, more or less the present day. That book will be out very soon. It's a December publication called Voices of the People. And each poem is faced with a different full color work of art by a different Native American artist. So it's, it's, a, it's a lovely book to read. And I'm honored to be in the presence of those truly gifted artists. How fantastic. That sounds excellent. It sounds like something uh, we'll have to keep an eye out for in December. Well, real quick then, as we you know begin to conclude here, I'm going to pull up uh, just the preview of coming events for those of you uh, who are tuning in, our classroom audience, our, our children's listener audience. Uh, our next installment of the Capitol Kids series is going to feature a friend of the U.S. Capitol Historical Society, uh, the chaplain of the United States Senate, Dr. Barry Black, uh, who has been giving really wonderful, powerful invocations for the Senate sessions for more than the last decade. Uh, and he's written a book called A Prayer for Our Country. Uh, and so that will be happening. And forgive me, that's not the right date and time. Uh, I forgive the typo. That's actually going to be happening November 29th. Uh, and you'll get an email about that. And then we have some other programs coming up here uh, just for our general audiences. I know we have some folks who tune in uh, from the general audience as well. We have uh, the Bridge of Spies speaking with Gary Powers Jr. about his father's experience as a U-2 pilot and the current state of U.S.-Russia relations with the historian at the uh, International Spy Museum. Uh, that's next week. Uh, we've got uh, How Thanksgiving Became a Holiday from the Wampanoag and Pilgrims to Washington and Lincoln, which should be a really uh, interesting exploration of the history of uh, what is focused as a singular holiday uh, by sort of you know, civic tradition, but as we've heard, has much deeper and broader roots uh, in, in uh, American Indian tradition. Uh, and then last but not least, we're also very excited to have uh, Dr. Joanne Freeman um, taking up the next uh, installment in our series on the amendments to the United States Constitution, uh, the 12th Amendment, the need to have a separately elected vice president of the United States, as opposed to it just being the runner up in the presidential election. So those are some upcoming programs. We always have our NPR moment, uh, as my colleague and friend Jane Campbell likes to say, that uh, we are a small nonprofit organization. And so we appreciate the folks who are able to support our work. Uh, and we love being able to have this sort of engagement with you and, and history and civics education and sharing the beautiful story, which is America. And so, Dr. Bruchak, thank you so much for bringing this beautiful story, both in Res Dogs and in sharing of your time today. We are tremendously grateful. Uh, and we thank all of you who tuned in as well to, to join us nationwide and in some cases worldwide. Worldwide, we're really glad to be of service. Well, Uli Pankani, may you all travel well.
Thank you so much. All right, everyone, be well and have a great rest of your week.